Hello and welcome to the Baby Giants Investing Podcast. Join us as we chat about the weird and wild world of small cap investing, all while searching for the precious few fast-growing businesses that have a shot at becoming industry giants. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and is strictly not intended as financial advice. Any opinions of general nature and do not take into account your personal circumstances, needs or objectives. Securities mentioned are for illustration purposes only and this podcast should not influence investment decisions. You should read the relevant PDS and consider speaking to a financial advisor before making investment decisions. Past performance is no indicator of future returns. Podcast guests and their clients may hold positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. All right, we're live, recording this in the thick of earnings season. We may be cutting it off a little early because we're probably jumping onto some more earnings calls in a bit. But yeah, I guess first, uh, a big announcement where we're going to be wrapping up Baby Giants. So yeah, I want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in over the years and all the messages that we've had. It's just been kind of a, a passion project for us. And yeah, we appreciate all the messages you've sent through. But yeah, this will be our, our, our final episode. So yeah, I don't know. Do you guys have any uh, any thoughts before we get into get into the app? I just uh, really loved uh, having all of the feedback from listeners. Like you guys made it for us. You guys are what made it fun. So thank you so much for, uh, yeah, like listening along and, and, and helping inspire the the next podcast yeah yeah it's been a heap of fun always enjoy chatting to you guys and yeah it's just one of those things right it's just proven to be more an issue of time than than interest and Mm. you know because it does it does take a little bit of effort we've all got like a lot on our plates and you know it's never been a well we don't have sponsors or anything so it's not it's not a monetizing kind of thing and not not that that's the only reason to do something but competing priorities i never sought i don't think i'd ever wanted to do a sponsored podcast anyway but nah topic for another day Nah, exactly. Well, let's face it. If someone had rocked up and said, "Hey, here's a million dollars," to maybe, like, okay. maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we have a price. It's just not a low price. Everyone's got a price, right? <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, look, yeah, uh, end of an era. It's been a good run. Yeah. The, sec- yeah, the second podcast we've put to bed, guys. That they're each one better than the one before. Nice one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump into it. Where do we kind of thinking what's going on in markets? Feel free to jump in, guys, with anything that you've seen. But I guess one of the big ones is just we've seen that rebound from that like shock of whatever it was, the carry trade unwind that somehow unwound in a day and, and bounced back. But it seems like maybe we're jinxing it recording this now, but as we're recording, it seems like back into a bull market. The peak is in, boys. Yeah. <laughs> now we've it said be, it. It's, it's kind of what happened crash. every other It every has other to crash time. before we actually publish the podcast now, right? Like mm-hmm. <laughs> The last two podcasts were like, oh, you know, it's back. And then it's like, it crashes. And by the time we publish a podcast, it's like the market seems to reverse course. So maybe this is putting it at top. Maybe that's how it'll go. But yeah, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts it seems to be like i don't know surprisingly calm considering how big of a deal you know people were talking about on that monday where the, the nikkei was down like 11 percent in a day but mm. then rebounded the next day like 10 percent. on a purely basic level i just think that it's a good sign because you know that's the that's the typical thing in a bull market right it just shrugs off bad news so you know it makes me think that the bull market's potentially you know sort of still on still with us i think i don't know on some instinctive cynical level i've always thought well I feel like a lot of people have a vested interest in keeping things ticking along at least until November. Mm. <laughs> like there's going to be a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Go on, Matt. I was just going to say that's actually like a big, yeah, like Marco Papak, one of the few guys who I, I kind of rate for big geopolitical stuff. He has a framework where he doesn't really predict. He looks at constraints rather than predictions. But anyway, he has talked about like everything favors markets being good until November. Like to the extent people can put their, their thumb on the scale, there is like a very big thumb going on the scale to try and keep things going well until that election <laughs> and then we'll see what happens after that yeah exactly and like i think maybe some people sort of start taking risk money off just before the election thinking all right we've had our run and you know i'm worried like i heard one person who actually likes trump but also thought trump would be bad for markets hmm. i have no idea well like, i would i have no idea what trump would do or whatever i think trump's bad for democracy but markets i'm not so sure <laughs> Yeah, his thought was Trump would be bad for markets just because, well, one, everyone's thinking he'll be good for them like last time because he'll cut taxes, but bad in that he's want to, going to want to spend a lot of money and then the bond market will start freaking out. So the idea would be like bond prices uh, start. Theresa May style thing. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Exactly that. Yeah, like that that starts to happen, that people actually worry about solvency in the US, which hasn't really been... I'm not, 
you know, not quite solvency immediately, but like starting down that line of thought, Andrew's like vigorously nodding with his like <laughs> <laughs> nothing <laughs> stops his train. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was yeah. that's kind of his view as well. That there would be like after that, you'd see you kind of see the the bond the bond market drive things where you know the bond market has a lot of control that isn't just the Federal Reserve for all we talk of them, you know, having the ability to influence rates. They, they aren't in full control and that would be that would be kind of like a bond what do they call it bond market vigilantes or something mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. <laughs> vigilante justice so yeah, yeah i mean it, who knows though man the election is back to like even odds i think this morning so i don't know what's going to happen there either way like that that's that's changed dramatically over the last month or two i had orchestrated myself i do small bets just for fun just because i'm like an obsessive about arbitrage mm. and i had a bet i'd like organized myself so i'd like bet on biden at a certain price and bet on trump at a certain price and either way i was going to win money if either of them won and of course then like that got blew out of the water (laughs) because when you know kamala took over from biden i hadn't put any money on her and so i was like oh god now there's like a losing opportunity i was like in the hole properly in the hole but bet some on kamala straight away or not actually this is i think i got in just before it became official when he got covid when biden got covid and obviously and i was like man he's already like struggling to sound articulate like that, that guy can't afford b- a bit of brain fog on top of it, you know? No. Uh, <laughs> no, so we cannot. <laughs> so. ne- neither candidate, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's weird. Kamala, it's like, oh, she's so young. It's like, she's 60. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, relatively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You mean she, she's not requiring cog state services? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I managed to bet on her anyway. And so now, because the odds have come in for her massively, I'm back to happy, happy go lucky win, win no matter what kind of positioning. Also, I guess because it's the last pod and far out, you know, why not? I am who I am. I work for myself. I'm going to tell you guys another story now. <laughs> we haven't heard the story. So. <laughs> I'm just like, stars. where are we going? Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, we can cut this out if it's not related to investing, right? But I wanted you guys to tell. Uh, I was in the jungle, you know. We all took a break. You guys did, you know, whatever you did. I went to Europe and I went to South America. And uh, I didn't take I'm a there. break. <laughs> you guys are uh, traveling yes. around having a merry old yeah, time. I had a family so- holiday. Claude went to the jungles of South America. I think a bit more adventurous than me. Go. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a holiday, you know, away on my own from my family. Got to like, you know, relive li- the glory days of of rampaging around the world doing what i want <laughs> and yeah so that took me with my uh like best school friend to to the jungle that's actually christian who writes for our website as well he's a phd really smart guy we're lucky to have him and so we're in the jungle we're staying in like these huts you know we're, we're doing our thing like there's no internet i have like one bar of 3g uh it, you know you have to f- do all these hours of flights from europe to get there blah 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 deep in there get on a boat you know well out of the way i'm walking you know in on the track for, from like my my hut and just go via christian's hut like walking to lunch or whatever it was and i get in front of him and then he just goes holy shit freeze and i'm like Ugh. you know freeze didn't tell me why or whatever and then he's just like stay still and then i just like he doesn't say anything i don't i just and then i just feel him sort of like go like and i feel him hit something on my back but then nothing comes off my back and he goes oh shit and like then like i'm like petrified at that point and then he goes whap again with his hand and i feel this sort of thud and look on the ground there near my foot and there's a tarantula you know as (laughs) big as a tea as big as a tea saucer uh i got a photo of it like it was sitting right on like just below my neckline and you know fuck, i just had the willies for for days after that you know just checking my clothes every time i put them on etc but i was like isn't that lucky isn't it beautiful that i had a friend that i've got a brother who will hit a tarantula off off my back <laughs> with his hand that's pretty freaky man they're they're a big big animal yeah yeah i looked it up afterwards like if you get bitten by one of them it's like yeah you're you're going straight to hospital mm-hmm. oh really Ah, oh, I didn't yeah. realize. So they're like, are they deadly or are they, they, what, what do they do? They're not, they're not, most of them aren't deadly, but you could survive it. But like the poison's so bad that it's going to give you like lymph, lymph, like issues in your lymphatic system. There could be like, you could have like ongoing issues, like as your body tries to deal through that that poisoning uh depending on the exact tarantula you get bitten by yeah wow okay i'm gonna have to come in with one now too completely well now that we're completely tangential to to what our subject matter (laughs) is so i was saying to matt before you joined claude before we started the thing i've been sort of like mucking about up in the backyard and i got all these ticks In, in, uh, over me these bites and I just sort of mentioned to my wife like, oh, it's really annoying I think I've got some ticks and she's like oh that can be really serious like yeah really like, oh yeah you can go to hospital because of that like are you joking ah uh, 
nah, I'll be fine. And then she's on her phone looking it up. She goes, oh, apparently you can get this thing called MMA, mammalian meat allergies, which means oh that God. you can't eat red meat anymore. I'm like, okay, let's get this done. <laughs> now... Now I'm now I'm now I'm like motivated to get do it something up, about get it. it. <laughs> get it up. Yeah, go to hospital, massive health issues. Nah, not that worried about it. Can't eat red meat. Okay, like <laughs> red alert. Red alert, let's go. So how big are the ticks? Like they're tiny. They burrow into your skin? Yeah. So they're tiny. You can barely see them? So the adult ones can be like three millimeters or so. Like okay. these, I got these all these little ones. I think I just like just walked through a nest or whatever it oh was. My God. Like, yeah, it's not fun. Yeah. They really gross out our listeners. Oh, yeah, look, uh, I w- look, this this didn't happen to me mercifully, but a word of warning to those who are partial to Al Fresco uh, romance: you, you definitely oh want to <laughs> you definitely want to keep the well of, well away from any ticks when you when you're engaging in that kind of behaviour. Oh, I've heard some, no. I've heard some horror stories. Oh, that's horrific. <laughs> Well, oh, okay, we, yeah, we, we can't be cancelled at this point. So like, <laughs> we'll lean into it. <laughs> can I just, can I go back to, can I just go back to something? Because I was nodding furiously when you were talking there, Matt. And yep. and I think the, the interesting thing was, is that just how quick the authorities blinked. So let's not forget why the central bank of Japan was doing what it was doing, right? Like it's it's trying to sort of normalizing as it has been forever. And the smallest, tiniest increment that they could have moved, they moved, they nearly collapsed global markets and they went, we're not doing that again. And and that to me shows you exactly what I think the future long term will will be in in the sense that there are the authorities that be are, are painted into a, a corner in terms of like fiscal or monetary policy. It's kind of like you can have all the debates as to the theory and the ideology that you think is going to happen, but it's like it's sort of like there's a mathematical inevitability to these things. It's like you can't you can't sort of wind back these things without breaking things seriously. So it's it's going to be real. So what do you think happened? There was just a lot of interventions from central banks after the kind of Nikkei crash kind of thing? Is that yeah, of- I think it's a bigger picture. I think it comes back to sort of the idea of how the US funds itself, you know? Mm-hmm. It funds itself from basically a lot of a lot of offshore money. <laughs> and again, I think it's such a critical point. We are so conditioned to think that, that the central banks sort of are the, are the masters of the universe here. And they're really not. The, the, the bond market is the boss here. It makes such obvious sense to me, at least, when you, when you think about it from first principles, it's like, hey, we want to borrow some money give us some money the promise is we'll give it back to you in you know five ten thirty years and we'll pay you some interest uh, uh, along the way that's that's the promise and everyone there's a reason why people prefer us t-bills as opposed to you know the argentinian bonds or whatever it, it's faith it's trust and now it's just sort of like well with whether it's trump or or the Dem- dems who, who win i mean they are so beyond sustainable at, at this kind of point and and then there's the geopolitic geopolitics on top of it it's like why am i buying this again i know it won't be defaulted on uh, it won't be a hard default or yeah. will be paid back nominally but you're going to have to offer me much higher interest rates given your fiscal situation which which sort of seems to be endemic like how to, again how do you Imagine the politician that says, hey, listen, we're going to wind back massively on social security and entitlements. And all this, like, you're, just, you're gone. You can't, it's a political suicide. So you, yeah. you, you cannot do it. And it's sort of like, well, I'll get, pay, I'll get my interest and I'll get my, my principal back. But in real terms, I'm probably going to lose purchasing power here, like in a, in a significant way. And that's when the Fed has a role to play, when they become the buyer of last resort, which just effectively means you're monetizing the debt, which is a fancy way of saying, well, we're just printing money. Money. And, you know, for those that think that that inflation is transitory or over, it's just like, it's always going to be a very difficult proposition in an environment of increasing debt monetization, I think. And again, I'm, I'm, I think that the danger that you have with these viewpoints is that you kind of see it and you think, oh my gosh, this is going to happen, but it could be like 15 years, 20 years. Like yeah, it's a slow a train yeah, wreck. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the thing to, rem- to, to remember with, with all of this stuff. I don't think there's anything imminent, but I do think that there's there's probably a case to be made of like a long volatile melt up of sorts of markets because like where else am I going to put my money right like I yeah. just I'm I, it, it's sort of like Apple stock becomes the new store of value as opposed to Treasuries because yeah it's just seen as safer and then you get you get something where this is gonna it's gonna mess with us as, with as investors who who try to pride ourselves on being fundamentally driven where there, there'll be a disconnect somewhere with some of these very very high quality companies where there's there's the sort of the cash 
cash flow underpinning to the valuation. And then there's the sort of implied monetary premium that is within that price as well, where it's going to maybe it's a, a new normal in this this world that we're we're moving into, where it's sort of like the old guard will go, oh, the average long term PE of markets tends to be about 16 and 25 is unsustainable. It's actually, well, the, the new the new normal could be 25, given given the world that we're in, uh, where we just all accept lower real returns because of Tina. There, there is no old alternative. Where else? You know, property is already negatively yielding in many parts of the world. Certainly, certainly here, you know, there's the valuations of a lot of these stocks are pretty astronomical, but bonds are just so unappealing. It's like, what do you do in that scenario? Anyway, I, I think it's, I just think, I just, that for me was the takeaway with the Japanese affair was just how, oh my gosh, the world's going to enter. No, it's okay. Because again, whatever is said and done at the end of the day, they will blink and they will print. And I'll I'd Good bet my left arm on that. Yeah. I think that, I mean, again, I've, I'm open to any pushback on that. I need at least a few more good years on the stock market so I can fully properly retire. You know, there's talk of sending- You like might get it. Private school. Like, <laughs> you might get it, man. It might, it might just- man. Be a, 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 as I say, it might. I, I remember that era. It wasn't that long ago. And perhaps we're still in it in a larger sense where all the, we sort of laugh, you know, the crusty old value investors going, I'm not getting involved. This is all madness. Like, well, what else are you going to do? That's and if, when if you make if, the money. Like, dude, if you're waiting for CSL to get back to a PE of 16, like, you might be waiting for a long time. Value right? investors waiting for the next crash is the buy sign. Like, like, there's a good few years after they stop buying that you can just run. Then, yeah, look, anyway, on a serious note, one stock idea that we did talk about ages ago uh like tying up loose ends andrew yeah uh, podcast number 83 june last year take you back we were talking about tax loss selling ideas oh, yeah. and one of the stocks that i pitched was fiducian group at the time and actually i just re-listened to the to the chat we had on that and like yeah you made a really great case for buying man so did i we we're kind of agreeing with each other. And eventually I did buy shares, albeit not at such good prices as what the, the share price was when we actually put out that podcast. Like I should have actually just, you know, probably not talked about it and bought it instead. But I make that kind of mistake all too often. And I just wanted to update because these guys have actually reported, you know, it's well clear. I've already um, published some time ago now the the results analysis for for supporters. So I thought that I just touched on it as a follow up. Obviously, with that disclosure, I do own it uh, myself. And the reason that I wanted to touch on it was because there was a thesis that we never like an element of the thesis we never really brought up. So what Fiducian does, right, is they have financial planning, funds management, and also platform administration. Essentially, the financial planning is an enabler of flows to the Fiducian platform and Fiducian funds management. Now, this is like vertical integration of financial advice. And there has been in the past, and I have expressed concerns concerns around um you know how that business model create conflicts that could be a problem and i think that has helped keep the price down of fiduci and that concern however i would encourage anyone interested in the stock to listen to the results calls that they that they put out <clears throat> because the founder indy singh like honestly every time i listen to him it make it calms my nerves around whether fiduci would do the right thing properly you know he speaks with great passion about how the, they have you know probably the most oversight of anyone and it's always been like consistently for 10 years a priority now that he wants to do the right things for clients the system that they have built it is an i believe designed to to look after clients like they're trying to have a system whereby essentially they're diversifying it's a fund of funds thing but it doesn't double dip in the in the fees the way it makes money is i guess it negotiates a bit of a fee discount with the funds that it's investing in on the basis of scale so as it scales hypothetically the discount that they get from the the funds that are in their fund of funds increases and hopefully that improves margins on top of that you got this platform admin business that they've just launched called auxilium which is a basically just a version of their own in-house system that they're now trying to sell to external clients now that has a hundred million under management at the moment and on the call they were like oh we you know indy singh said oh you know give us two years basically is, is what he kind of implied and i'm paraphrasing there but look i don't know if they achieve something in that that's a business that's sort of similar to hub which i also own shares in by the way or net wealth which obviously trade on much higher p ratios than fiducian so i guess that was like you know i thought it was good results it was it was good results this set obviously you know this is a company funds management it's going to go up when market goes up go down when market goes down but yeah look i think there were some elements of the thesis there that i didn't really do justice to when we when we chatted about it ages ago so i wanted to chuck that in yeah i kind of wish you didn't because i didn't do anything about it either so that's kind of annoying <laughs> you know what? it's interesting there's there's been a, a few sort of big fund managers what is it the other one generation development came up on the call the other day and 
Uh, yeah, right. Another, and GQ, that's right, GQG partners. And it just, it, <laughs> there's this, I, I don't know if it's a sort of, I'm, I'm cherry picking here, I probably am. And it's all entirely anecdotal, but it just sort of seems like it seems to be, you know, in an environment that feels as though it should be hard. In, for investing, it's like there is quite substantial fund flows in here, which is sort of driving a lot of these things, which is interesting. Well, I own shares in GDG as well, actually. And they even have a deal with Fiducian. I think Fiducian White Label is one of their insurance bond products. And look, the theory is, and like someone told me about like one of my fund managers that I invest in their funds, they, like, they told me about GDG like ages ago. And I wish I'd listened. Uh, I did get on more recently with the cap raise or around the time of the cap raise. But uh, essentially, like the idea there is that cha- potential changes in tax laws could be driving flows to their insurance bond thing. So, you know, I think I don't actually understand that one well in terms of that's just a small position for me. But I do agree that, yeah, like you can, I guess, in these kind of financial funds management style businesses, if they are growing, operating leverage can work and they can be quite scalable businesses. So uh, obviously that works both ways though. So they, they can be risky. And we see with Magellan or Perpetual, when these things turn over and roll over and have outflows, what it does to the share price. Like you just can't be in the stock basically in my view once things go start going backwards at a rate of knots. I find it disappointing, like from a broader view here, is just how financialized like the economy has become, which is actually a theme of like late stage empires, whether the Romans, the British, the Dutch or whatever, it's always towards the end. And so in the, I heard a stat the other day, the US in the 50s, the financial insurance sector was two and a half percent of GDP and now it's 10%. I believe in Australia, we're about 10% of our economy is is from the financial sector. A very Look, we work in the financial sector. We're advocates for it. It plays an important role in capital allocation and the rest of it. But it just feels, I don't know, am I, am I, am I being too doomer here? It just, it just feels like, I don't know, the, the whole, the yeah, whole world. I think world... that's right. But like the, the end stage of the tale of the empire can last 200 years, you know? Yeah, so... that's, it's true. Yeah. It, it's just, it's just, I find it, it's, I find it more depressing in the sense of the, uh, so much talent and brain power is sucked into this industry. So young, capable people who may be otherwise tempted to go into engineering or medicine or computer science or something, it's like the money's in finance, which is really yeah, just- I, I wanted to write about trees. Yeah, Here I right? am writing about stocks. <laughs> So, I mean, I I don't know. It's, I don't know what my point is other than it's just, it feels as though there is a, it's just a poor allocation of capital and resources from a societal point of view. I guess is my broader point here. And, you know, just increasing financial engineering and I don't know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a bit, it's a, I don't know, it's annoying. It's depressing. It's concerning. It's all of those things. But anyway, that's a broader topic over a beer one time. Matt's, Matt's staring off into the distance. I, know, <laughs> I, I think it's sad. Yeah, just, just, like just let me know when, end, let me know when results, Andrew's finished. <laughs> more, more results just dropped. Is like... Yeah. No, no, it's all going to come crashing down, maybe. <laughs> we'll no, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but it is, it is, it is, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a shame when our best and brightest go into marketing, PR and finance yeah, as yeah, opposed to anything so. that is genuinely value cre- a- a- Andrew's, creative. Andrew's like literally going to like go out on the last episode by like offending like ev- everybody. Like, uh, this, this is such if a If you work in industry. any of the following industries. <laughs> <laughs> I watched, I watched, there was another, another thing that's really fascinating here, just while we're, why not last episode, um, the, the rise of the professional MBA CEO and just how they sort of, there was a period, things like Boeing, Intel, others, where you sort of had these sort of engineered based CEOs who certainly made mistakes, but were very focused on the value that they were creating. And you had these very clever people with more of these MBA sort of background who delivered outstanding profit growth, basically by hollowing out businesses and stuff. And it's just now that, you know, things where it's sort of like, actually, let's, let's take, we've got really cheap access to capital. Let's take all of that and buy back our stock. It means that I can get all my incentives. I can get my options in the money and it actually juice profits. It'll juice the share price. It does everything. But again, it's, it's sort of like clever in a way. It just hollows out the business. And then like, it's kind of cool until it's not. And then like everyone realizes that, huh, there's this, this, this business is really not what it, what it used to be. Think about all the opportunities that, that Intel missed, right? Think of Boeing, right? Like what happened there? It's just, Again, it's just another thing that you look at and, and despair. Yeah, there's a few like that. I think there's one I looked at quite closely in New Zealand called Scalar Up, which had a really good, well, a really efficient manager, which I think, you know, wasn't growing revenue, but just got 
profits, like just really made it all hum. But the downside is if you're too focused on efficiency, I think you can lose some of the, I don't know, the taking random bets and stuff that allows you to grow. You know, like you need some of the randomness and inefficiency to kind of have the yep. resilience and, and growth. And yeah, that can be the, 100%. the end result, I think. It, and it, resilience. It's kind of like hollowing out. Resilience is such a good point there too, is this idea of whenever I hear someone criticize a company for a lazy balance sheet, it makes me roll my eyes. You know, it's sort of like, again, in theory with your spreadsheet broken out, you can do some very clever things, but it just like, there's no, you, you, you lose the anti-fragility that you would want in a business. And yeah. there's there's a lot to be said for a, for a fortress style balance sheet. Even if it might be lazy, it means that you're super bulletproof no matter what comes your way and can be hyper opportunistic when others who are less prudent with their balance sheets get them inevitably get themselves in, into trouble. I mean, look at COVID as well. Like if you want to take a different angle on that, like all the just in time stuff is just like hyper, hyper, hyper efficient, but just zero robustness. And con- there are consequences with, with all of that kind of stuff. And that, and that may have led to a bit of a nearshoring trend as well, which is something to keep an eye on. Look, mm. but keep an eye on the, on the time. Uh, can we uh, move on to another little small cap? Yeah, sure. sure. I, guess, I guess so. Technically, it's a, that's what we're here for. Look, for the last one that we'd talk about, uh, talk about on the podcast, I thought, look, I'm, I'm going to not choose it myself. I'm going to leave it into the hands of fate. So I chose one of the small cap mailbags that, I, that I've been recently published for supporters. So small cap mailbag is a series of articles that's mostly just um, behind the paywall at A Rich Life. And, and the way it works is that I just like wanted to do something whimsical and put myself more in the hands of fate. So I'm now just collecting lots of small cap suggestions for companies from my support supporters who, you know, anyone can write in as many different small caps as they want. And then I'm choosing one of them and writing about that at like multiple times a week, obviously not in earnings season, but but generally speaking. So that's the plan there. And I decided to go with uh, Canatico, which is company is small. It's very much a micro cap. It's actually interesting, I guess, to me, because it is partly a software company or it has elements of software in it. It used to be called CV Check. That's its main business. And so I guess the CV Check business is a situation where like an employer, for example, Um, or potential employer can ask using that platform in a fairly streamlined way, ask potentially a whole number of candidates all at once to, um, you know, to get a C, uh, to get a police check. And the way that it works that I think is an advantage, potential advantage, or at least a perceived advantage is that then essentially CV check orders that police check and sends it directly to the employer who's requested it. So I guess they that employer can feel very confident in the authenticity of that police report, which has been ordered itself by um, CV Check. Now, researching this, you know, you can see where they get the margin because it might cost sixty dollars to do that through CV Check and forty dollars if you just went to the police. And by the way, they're wrong numbers, but I'm just giving you an example. Uh, a lesser amount if you go directly to the police and order that check. And of course, the police do have an authenticity check system as well so it's actually you probably don't need the cv check thing but you can sort of see how it works as an organizing platform and stuff like that they've basically taken that business and they're trying to turn it into more of a software as a service like i guess hr kind of suite of solutions there so what they do is is they talk about their uh, software as a service compliance offering so that might be doing extra things like i guess if checks have to be redone regularly like you might have have a bankruptcy check every six months or something or whatever it is for, for your role. They can just order them or like, you know, have that all go automated. The the emails all go automated to the person who needs it, it needs to, you know, fill in the information, et cetera, et cetera. So a bit of an efficiency software, a bit of a business to business software there. And they're, Overall revenue is basically flat, but the story is the legacy revenue is going down and the software as a service revenue is going up. So the good looking part of the story is essentially, you know, hey, we've got this fast growing business inside the bigger business that's sort of being hidden. I guess the the counter to that would be, well, yeah, what if you're just like the overall revenue is not growing at all? Are you just cannibalizing the legacy revenue to grow the software as a service revenue. And I'd say that probably the jury's a little bit out on that because definitely they are converting some of those clients, you know, to the new product. So I'm not sure how much that's an element of the whole thing, but I'm just putting both sides of it. I'm not, I'm not coming, you know, I'm not coming over with an overall view of whether it's buy, hold or sell, but this is what I found when I took a look at it for the small cap mailbag. And then the other negative that 
you know, I, I guess I'd bring out is that it's one of those curious ones where it does have quite, even though it's a small company, there's quite a lot of investor relations presence there. So I think, you know, there's a bit of it. They definitely, you know, make an effort and spend money in getting their story out there. If you Google the name of the company, you know, the, the investors page is very prominent, put it that way. And uh, yeah, look, perhaps an intelligent, just the low price isn't too demanding, I would say, given that it does have quite a lot, like I think $10 million cash market capitalization last i looked at around 50 million dollars so it's a little one it is of the like that we have been seeing some companies these side these sides kind of getting taken over and stuff like that so possibly valuation on your side there but look not one that i have a strong view of either way but definitely an interesting little small cap so yeah appreciated that that suggestion for small cap mailbag yeah it looks interesting i i just as a general Thing, it just rubs me the wrong way that companies that spend a lot of time promoting to investors, you know, I know that there is a certain requirement to that, but it's sort of, it always makes me think of supply network, zero promotions, barely answer your email, right? Long-term chart is just incredible, you know, disclosure and supply network. Let the, um, let the business performance speak for itself. The, the, the trouble is I, I find it self-defeating anyway, because even if you are successful, you attract the exact wrong type of capital and shareholder base. You get you get those that are there for a good time, not a long time. You get there you get those that are expecting huge things and will be disappointed with anything that falls short of that, and that will drop you like a hot potato the second things that kind of turn. It's sort of like so. It's sort of like even when it's successful, it's not really. Whereas just sort of like I don't know. I I, I guess there is a reality of you know we need a, a decent price to to make our access to capital cheaper but but that's the thing is do you need capital that's the question that it makes me wonder like, i think the answer if, is yes the answer is yes 10 million in cash if you've got 10 million in cash and you're like break even why do you need to like get your share price up i that's tell you why I, I tell you why because again it goes back to my my cynical view of of the industry where it's like there's a whole machinery set of machinery around raising capital and that and it's like you know you got to drum up business if you're an investment banker you go and knock on the door of some willing ceo and say man we can would you like another 10 million dollars i know that you don't really need it but now's a good opportunity don't know if the market's going to turn what's going to happen after the november elections blah 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 lots of things that sound sort of good it's like gosh this people who worked in the industry for 30 years think that it's really, you know, a good time to sort of do this. And I, and I guess I should, and it, I can totally see how it, it sort of, it sort of happens. I think you, you get a lot of people who are just sort of talked into it by people who have vested interests. And maybe that's too cynical, but I, I'm sure that that is a phenomenon, at least, at least among some companies. I definitely, it definitely is even like really good companies. Like I can remember, you know, just feeling, I think like with this with Volpara, like it got to the point where I was like, I feel like the brokers are just like, they love it. They're like, yeah, just keep raising capital. You know, like, it's like, yeah, you want them to keep burning and raising capital because you clipping the ticket on it every time. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. actually like the company should just not raise capital, which eventually mm -hmm. it changed gears and got immediately taken out. Like anyway, yeah, I guess any, any thoughts on, on the segment, the like, you know, the small cap tech stock stuff has been pretty crashed out what are we what are you thinking about that segment like i think that it's i don't know if that's true do... i don't know if that's true i think it's i think it's, it's only some takeover that's bounced back a bit or what I, I think it's 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 such a horrible term but it's more a stock pickers market where there i think you're generally true but there are there's some examples within all of that of those that just continue to do really really well and it's it's surprise surprise it's driven by the business performance right and i think this is the emperor's new clothes kind of phenomenon here exactly to my point there was some companies that for a time did wonderfully well through effective communication and the rest of it but ultimately there was nothing there to support it all the promise never eventuated and i'm i'm the biggest sucker of all i will happily uh, you know uh, absorb the siren song that that oh we're going to do this and it's just going to happen next quarter and look what this and you know let's like virus suite's a great example of that which i've just finally finally you know accepted that that's that's just probably going to always be a gunner company but there are so i i I don't like this idea that you get too much from from people in our industry it was like oh it's a rotation into this sector and that and it just sounds good and all it does is create motion without any sort of purpose w within that there are some great opportunities there are some good companies that are still out there and companies that are performing incredibly well despite whatever broad thematic that a talking head wants to sort of mention there and that's our opportunity frankly i was like could i care less if there's a rotation in or out of this or what's going to happen like no I, ideally i get some of these really quiet achievers that just fall from favor for no good reason and but that that would make me a very happy investor, even if it meant short term losses. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Andrew. I think that with focus, keeping focused on what you're 
what's happening within the market rather than the market overall. And, you know, there's an argument, we'll see what happens, but there's an argument that with kind of valuations are fairly high now, but there's this argument they just go kind of flat, like kind of sideways, like the sideways market idea for quite a while. Like you don't, you maybe have some run-ups and some dips, but it's less of like a huge bull run like we had from 2011 to 2000 and whatever, 21. Mm-hmm. And maybe just more like the sideways. And then that sideways thing, some people would say, I just don't own stocks. But within that, there's going to be these incredible stories still, you know? So I think that yeah. that, yeah, I think that that's the, especially for small kind of, we're not a- allocating $100 billion and, you know, we can get in and out of stuff. So yeah, I think that that's the, it's keeping that in mind is important. I mean, a good example of that would be uh, some of the Japanese companies over the last decade or so that have done well, right? Like awful mm-hmm. economy, terrible market, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's just another nice example of there are, the market is not the economy and the market is not what you're, unless you're a passive index investor, the market is not what you're investing in, right? You're buying stocks. There. Even exactly. in situations that are difficult overall, there might be headwinds, you, you can still do well. And the, and the counter view of that as well, as we've talked about this before as well, is China, which has just gone insanely good from a GDP nation sort of perspective, but the markets and, the, and investments on that have been, have been awful it's yeah it's just it's just worth remembering that they're two separate things and you don't need to participate in folly (laughs) you know you can you can be very strategic about things and just go listen if there's a good opportunity i'll take it if there's not i'll just sit on my hands and it's hard to do and i'm not saying i can do it well god knows i can't but (laughs) at least i know that the 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 principle that you know the ideal that you should aim for and i I think i think that's worth just reiterating i think you are very good at it but let's (laughs) wrap it there gents yeah final episode what's uh what's way that people can stay in touch or you know keep following what you're working on well, I would love it for anyone to jump on a rich life and and find how to sign up to the just the free newsletter. Even I am super infrequent emailer, maybe once a month, maybe once three months. I don't really know. But what I do do is I occasionally send hidden content to the free email that you wouldn't otherwise found if you just you know looked on the website or clicked through or whatever. Like essentially, I'll just remove the paywall on a couple of things and then send it to the free email once in a while. So. Yeah, just uh, keep, you can keep in touch with me that way. And and of course, if you're a supporter, uh, yeah, keep the... I've got actually quite a lot of small cap mailbag suggestions now. So but from the call out I did last week, but uh, essentially, yeah, if you're a supporter, please keep keep them coming. I'm not necessarily going to do them in order. I might just randomize it a little bit. So, but it's great to have a good backlog of ideas and I'm enjoying my like the, the new sort of whimsical path I'm going to take after we get through earning season. Yeah, Excellent. nice. Oh yeah, just go to Straw, straw Man, yeah, head them. Strawman.com. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Sign up for a free account. You can start yep. getting a taste for it. Or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I, I like, like honestly, I've, I've really, I've really <laughs> leaned into this. Like, I, I just. The, Andrew the, needs a holiday, guys. We need. I'm he not, needs like a holiday, like what I had. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just not a natural marketer, and I honestly, I feel I'm pretty self-aware that what we do is pretty niche, <laughs> and so it's not going to be suitable for me. Those who get it, get it, and they'll come yeah. along, and those that don't, don't. So that's cool. You do you. But I'll sing the praises. Like, yes, yeah, Strawman's a great community. Like, it's actually really hard, you know, in this day and age to keep like communities positive and nice on the internet. Like, it was so, you know, 20 years ago, it starts so innocent. Everyone's there. Like, you know, people met the love of their life on Craigslist or whatever. Like, it was mm. also like open hearted but uh, Straw Man keeps it real. So yeah, love that as well. Thanks, man. And I'll be writing publicly again at wholebraininvesting.com or mattjoss.com. I do run an investment fund, mavenfunds.com.au for anyone looking at that. And yeah, I'm I'm thinking of uh, doing a small kind of mentoring slash learning group. I've been meaning to do it for ages to kind of give back a free one. I'm not charging like a thousand dollars an hour like some folks, but yeah, looking at doing something like that. So maybe watch that space. I'll release it maybe in the next couple of weeks. And how will people hear about that? Like whole whole brain investing and then you'd, you'd email it to whole brain investing. Thing? Yeah, I'll probably put it in there. I'll probably just tweet it out maybe on the Baby Giants thing and, and my, my Twitter. So anyone following there will probably see it. So um, yeah. And I'm allowed well. to attend as well, right? Like just to, to you might maybe we'll bring you in as an expert. Yeah, I don't know. No, I always learn I always learn off you, mate. I'll release a few more details on it, but yeah, exactly, exactly. We can learn from each other. So but yeah, no, <laughs> thanks very much yeah, to everyone. Awesome. Um it's been awesome. We get a lot of very nice messages through and not many that I mean. <laughs> no, we got a lot of really nice stuff and I'm sure we'll get a few as we wrap it up. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. It's been been really awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you guys are great. You made it You made it for us. So uh, have a nice day, life, journey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll wrap awesome. it there. Thanks very much. Cheers. Yeah. Bye.